dive into yep, um, into uh, the session, let me cover a few important housekeeping items. So let me just share my screen. Okay. Uh, so first and foremost, we want to extend a warm welcome to each of you. And we're currently getting everyone out of the waiting room to ensure, ensure a smooth start. So thank you for your patience while we do this. We would also like to inform you that the session is being recorded and will be available on the MAPC YouTube page. And the link to the recording will also be shared with you in a follow-up email after the session. And to ensure a smooth and focused session, everyone will be muted throughout the presentation to avoid disruptions. If any participant becomes disruptive during the event, they will immediately be removed um, from the webinar and won't be able to rejoin. And additionally, in the unlikely event of a Zoom bombing incident, the meeting will be terminated promptly to protect our discussion. Now, as we begin, I'd like to kindly ask that you take a moment to rename yourselves and to include your first and last name and if possible, the town or the organization that you're representing today. And to do this, just click on the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom window, um, locate your name in the participant list, click more and select rename. Um, and to engage with us during the session, please either use the chat or the Q&A function um, to submit your questions and feel free to put your questions into the chat at any point during the talk and we'll do our best to address as many questions at the end as possible with the understanding that we may not have the time to answer all of them at the end of the session. Um, I'd also like to show you how to change your view settings so that the speaker or speakers are spotlighted, and this way you can have a better view of the content. And you can do this by clicking at the view options in the top right corner and selecting speaker view from the drop down menu. And if anyone experiences any technical issues during our session, please don't hesitate to reach out to our tech support staff, Kat. Kat is here to assist you and to ensure a smooth experience for everyone. Um, and today's session is a joint partnership between the Rooted in Nature series and the Accelerating Climate Resiliency series. So before we move forward, I'd like to take a moment to give you a bit of background on our Rooted in Nature series before turning it over to Van to talk about the Accelerating Climate Resiliency series. So spanning five thematic sessions, we have gathered experts from indigenous communities right here in Massachusetts to offer an exploration of indigenous perspectives on climate resiliency and sustainability. The series supports the implementation of Metro Common 2050, our regional land use plan, particularly our strategies to advance climate mitigation and resiliency and inclusive growth and development. It also aligns with the broader shift in the climate resiliency landscape, recognizing and uplifting indigenous knowledge as a vital resource. An example of the shift is the recent formation for the Center for Braiding Indigenous Knowledge and Science at UMass Amherst, led by Dr. Sonia Adelay. And the series by MAPC mirrors this progressive approach aiming to enhance climate adaptation strategies by fostering a deeper understanding of indigenous cultures and encouraging collaboration for cross municipality projects that are geared to address the impacts of climate change collectively. So now I'm going to turn it over to Van Du, our Assistant Director for Environmental Planning, who's going to say some words about the Accelerating Climate Resiliency series, which, like I said, today's session is also a part of. So thank you, Van. Thanks, Lindsay, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is such a great collaboration that we love to have with arts and culture department. So um, it's really great to see this coming together. And thank you, a special thanks to our, our guest speakers that you'll hear in, in a moment. Um, I just wanna share a little bit about the Accelerating Climate Resilience Grant Program, which is in its fifth year. And this is a generous, uh, with generous support from the Bar Foundation. Um, this program uh, aims to accelerate climate resilience implementation in the MAPC region to help cities and towns advance strategies that protect people, places, and communities from the impacts of climate change. Um, and as part of this grant program, we offer a resilience community of practice to support grantees um, networking, have peer-to-peer -peer sort of platform to learn um, and support each other. 
And then um, we also have the speaker series, which is open to everyone in the public. And the, um, the purpose of the speaker series is to make sure that we are bringing in experts, practitioners from across the country. Uh, at some point last year, um, we had someone from Australia to, so I think we could say globally, um, who can speak to the ways that, um, you know, uh, in, of inspiring, innovative, but also um, solutions that we should think about and bring it back here to our region um, in supporting um, advancing re resilience projects here in, in um, our region. And so with that, uh, thank you again. We're, I'm really looking forward to hear um, about today's sessions and I'll turn it over to Lizzie. Great, thank you so much, Van. Um, it's so nice to meet all of you. I'm Lizzie Wyant, the Deputy Executive Director at MAPC. Um, I'm so thrilled to be able to participate in um, the third of this five part series. Um, you know, I think planning has a very long history. Um, and at times that history has included some extractive practices in the communities, even that we serve. And I think that this session um, together with um, the Accelerating Climate Resiliency session gives us a chance to actually take a more holistic and inclusive approach to our planning work. And that's why I'm so glad that we have been able to move ahead with this series and our participation has been um, pretty off the charts, as you can see, as folks are still kind of coming into our Zoom room today. Um, it has also, I'll acknowledge, been a very difficult week. And so it is wonderful to actually have a chance to be in community with so many people. Um, I just really appreciate that everyone is here, um, so eager to learn about this as we are. I'm so proud of the teams that have put this series together because it is um, a pretty wonderful thing for our agency to actually be able to think about how we make the region a better place for the people who live, work, and play here and really keep our eye um, on the land and the people who help steward it in a way that is ecologically sound. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Lindsay, who I think is going to introduce our speakers. Um, I'm very excited to hear from them. And I'm very, we have already some incredibly rich questions from our participants. So I think we're going to have a really wonderful day. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Lizzie. And your thoughtful message highlights that today's session is integral to MAPC's ongoing commitment to expanding and enriching our approach to our work. So now let's move forward with our program and introduce our main speakers, the people who you are here to uh, here to listen to. So Linda Coombs is a citizen of the Aquina Wampanoag tribe on Martha's Vineyard and has lived in Mashpee for more than 40 years. Her, her two grandchildren are enrolled with the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, as was their father and grandfather. Linda has worked for 49 years as a museum educator and spent 11 years total at the Boston Children's Museum, 30 years in the Wampanoag Indigenous Program at Plymouth Plantation, and nine years at the Aquinnah Cultural Center. The ACC is one of the oldest homesteads in the Aquinnah community, built by an Aquinnah Wampanoag man, now a museum regarding Aquinnah Wampanoag history. She has been an interpreter, artisan, and researcher, led workshops and teacher institutes, written children's stories and articles on various aspects of Wampanoag history and culture, and developed and worked on all aspects of a wide variety of exhibits. Linda has also worked extensively with her own Wampanoag communities as well as with the public. The goal of Linda's work continues to be the communication of accurate and appropriate representation of the history, cultures, and people of the Wampanoag and other indigenous nations. And Brett Stearns is our other speaker. And he is the director of the Natural Resources Office for the, of the Wampanoag Tribe of Gay Head, which is Aquina, where he spearheads the design and oversight of various environmental projects. In this role, he skillfully na navigates the delicate balance between traditional use and knowledge and the advancements of emerging science. Brett's diverse responsibilities extend beyond his directorial position as he also serves as a police officer for Aquina and Chilmark assistant harbor master and shellfish constable in Aquina, a Massachusetts hunter safety ins instructor and holds a captain's license and dedicates himself to serving as a Tri-Town EMT, which I hope is all still very accurate, Brett. Um, but I will turn this over to both Linda and Brett now. So thank you and welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us on such a beautiful day. Um, to start off with, I, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the Europeans that came here in the 17th century. Um, <clears throat> as you know, I probably don't have to tell you the familiar story of the pilgrims coming into what became Plymouth, but uh, uh, just to clear up a stereotype right up front, it, they came into Wampanoag country, but we didn't go there and greet them. They just happened to land within the bounds of our country. Before the pilgrims, however, there was a hundred years of, you know, many other ships from different countries in Europe coming over here to trade, explore, to fish. Um, they took slaves, they, they did a lot of things, um, but they also wrote down uh, descriptions of the, the people and the landscape <clears throat> that they were seeing. And they described huge forests, um, millions, of animals and birds, fish, you know, um, just this lush, abundant, uh, they, they refer to it as Eden or paradise because it was so, so beautiful. And in spite of that, they, however, made no connections between this condition of the landscape and the indigenous people that lived there, okay? Um, they were very busy regarding us as being backward and primitive um, the reason that Europeans were coming here was, you know, goes back uh, to one point of the Doctrine of Discovery in the 15th century, which stated that um, people who weren't Christians weren't human. So Christians can go into their lands, take those lands, take the resources of the land, and, you know, do what they will for the betterment of the countries that they were sailing for. So they had that image of us in mind. So therefore they didn't make the connection of how we related to the earth or what our relationship was with the earth. And indigenous people for our part, uh, we'd been living here for 15 or 20,000 years. And over that time uh, had developed many ways, our cultures, uh, practices, everything um, came, you know, it's such a, depth of knowledge, you know, this intimate knowledge and understanding of what the earth was about, okay? And how we're supposed to act on the earth. So our creation histories, and you notice I use the word history, not myth, not legend, not story, but history, um, take us back to the time of creation. And there are many, many stories of, uh, of create many histories of creation from many different tribes, you know, across the country, um, throughout different regions, they're similar. So in the Northeast here, you know, the, there's there's a lot of at least similarities between the tribes. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with the film "We Still Live Here." That's about the founding of the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Project, and in the film, they're discussing uh, some of the written sources of the Wampanoag language. And in that they found a story of how the creator had made us from stone. But we were clunky and, you know, kind of dim-witted and we didn't love each other enough. So he recreated us out of the white pine. And the white pine is our ancestor, our relative, okay? And all of the tribes in New England area um, have a different tree the birch, the ash, the maple, you know, as their ancestors. So there is that similarity. But the creator had made uh, everything in creation, all the plants, trees, waters, animals, winds, whatever there is, he made it first. He made humans last, okay? And he made things to work in a certain way, which is what I call natural law or can be called natural law. Um, another word might be ecosystems or biomes. Um, and everything in creation was given at the time of creation, original instructions. Okay, so ants um, do what ants do, bears do what bears do, 
Sharks do what sharks do. The wind does what it does. You know, all of that sort of thing. And as long as everything in creation is doing what it's supposed to, then everything works and the balance is kept. The job of human beings was to keep all of those systems working as creator intended. That's our original instruction. Sounds simple when you say it. It's not really that simple in practice. And clearly, we, we have not done such a good job of it. But out of uh, these original instructions, you know, there emerged a, a system of values that native cultures are created on. And the main value I think is respect. If you respect your relatives, whether they're human or non-human, then you don't hurt them or damage them. That's kind of a simplistic view, but it, it can be that easy. And our cultures were developed in a way that, you know, flesh that out, if you will, into all our different cultural practices. You know, um, our traditional cultures were formed out of our original instructions. Um, every aspect of culture came from these things, our language, the relationships between people and how people treated one another, the structure of our societies, our laws and governments, the way we lived our material life and our relationship therefore with the earth. This also includes our spiritual ways and our ceremonies. And I think ceremony, I see ceremony as uh, sort of like the how-to book that creator gave us to carry out our original instructions, to keep those instructions present in our mind, in the forefront of our mind so that we live in right relationship. <clears throat> um, and ceremony is to give thanks, to acknowledge our other lives and also all of creation. Humans, just like any other being in the world, must eat, clothe themselves, build homes, prepare medicines, keep warm. All of these things that sustain our basic life must by the nature of things impact or take the lives of other beings. And we are part of the natural world, just like the ants, the bears, the waters, the oak trees, and like them, we take from the world to sustain our lives. Since our instructions are to keep the world as created, to keep it in balance, we cannot just take and do nothing in return. The act of taking obligates us to give back. And so we perform ceremony, and we recognize our relationship with those other beings, and we are in thanksgiving for their sacrifice. Uh, humans also had many different practices that gave back in some fashion, so that creation is kept even as we have to take to live. This is reciprocity. Okay. Um, and this is also reflected, you know, in our languages. When I introduced myself in the Wampanoag language, I would tell where I'm from. And I would say, Nutamas Aquanahanat. That means I'm from Aquina. But it doesn't just mean, um, you know, I'm from number two Elm Street down there on the left in Aquina. What that word actually means is that my DNA comes from that place. That, that place in myself, that earth of that place in myself are one thing, okay? And knowing that, that's what, you know, generates that respect for the land. And if I wanna say land, um, the word for land is ahki. And I, because of the structure of the Wampanoag language, which I'm not a linguist, so I won't attempt to get into all that, but <clears throat> land, you cannot just talk about land in and of itself. It has to belong to someone, I guess, because it's a relative. So if I'm gonna say my land, you might think it would be the, to say my or I, there's a prefix na, N-U. Okay, um, and we put a T in there to make that word flow more smoothly. 
So you might think it would be nataki, but that's not correct either. So there's a suffix added, the letter M, and the word would be natakim. That F M uh, suffix, rather, that is the, the part of the word that tells you that myself and the land are one thing, that we cannot be separated. Okay. Um, but when the English came here in the 17th, 16th, 17th century, they didn't recognize all of this. They were too busy thinking we're primitive and backward and all of this sort of thing. Um, they, they had no concept of our relationship with the earth. Um, they felt that we were in need of civilizing, of Christianizing, um, and they began to impose many processes of colonization that over 400 years have interrupted, disrupted, or halted the ways that we had practiced for centuries to carry out our original instructions and to keep the earth in balance, okay? Uh, for example, slavery was one of the first things that happened. There were slavers that were on the seas coming to these coasts before 1620. Squanto is one of the people that was kidnapped I'm sure everyone has at least heard of his name. Um, he was gone for five years, uh, sold into slavery in Spain, and you know, after five years, managed to come back here. But a few, um, and a lot of men were sent into slavery after the, the end of King Philip's War in 1675. Boatloads of men, and the whole point was just to get the men out of here. If there's no men, there's no resistance, there's no fighting. There's also the people, it was their job to build our homes, to hunt and provide meat for the family and, and to do many other things. And those things were taken away when people are put into slavery. With, with the introduction of Christianity, uh, people were forced to live like the English. We were to be as much like the English as we could be. In our traditional society, the women did the farming, growing corn and beans, squash, pumpkins, melons, and sunflowers. The reason that we did that, because corn is believed to be a female spirit, and of course, as are women. So it just makes sense to have a female spirit nurture another one. But in the European way, men were the farmers. That's a 360 degree flip, you know, that totally impacted, you know, the way that we related to the land. Um, along with Christianity, uh, there's what I call psychological warfare, which is something that was an ongoing process. It could happen in an interaction a meeting on the street of a native person and a non-native person where the native person somehow gets undermined. Christianity, um, you can read over and over again in the sources how uh, people you know, on their deathbed were asking to be forgiven for the state in which they were born. They were not talking about Massachusetts. They're talking about being bo uh, born as a non-Christian or as a Wampanoag person. So if someone is brought to the point where they're asking to be forgiven for who they are, who they were born as, you know, there's, there's kind of not the space to go out and deal with the land in the same way. So colonization is something that happened on a lot of fronts in a lot of ways. Um, by 1650, Harvard was building the, the Indian school, as it was called. And that was to teach us, reduce us to civility, which I find an interesting term, but English in the 17th century is used very differently from that of today. But it was to teach us different ways of mind, okay? Um, and was intended to replace our traditional ways of thinking and being and being in relationship with the earth. Um, a lot of times, you know, there were, uh, you know, 
once black slavery began and there were, you know, black slaves were sometimes taken into native communities or people were listed on censuses as black, whether they were or not. And that has to do with the fact that black people coming from a different continent, a different place, do, do not have the same relationship with the land here that we do. So if we mix with black people and become black, at least in the eyes of others, that lessens our connection to the land under our feet here. At least that's the way the thinking goes. Doesn't work out like that in reality, I'm happy to say. Um, but there were many other things. The English uh, would build houses on, on our old cleared cornfields. It kind of, you know, interferes with the whole growing process of corn. Um, when you cut trees down for farms, for shipbuilding, mast making, um, you know, whatever other reasons that they had, it diminishes or stops the way that we interacted with that forest or any of the beings in the forest. You know, even today, there's restrictions on hunting, there's restrictions on fishing, shell fishing, foraging, uh, farming, um, all of those things. And ceremony is done out on the land. I was just having a conversation yesterday about we need to start going back through our traditional territory and having doing offerings because the land needs that. It needs us, you know. Um, our our whole way of life was interrupted because we used to move seasonally. You know, Aquina is one of 69 original villages of the Wampanoag Nation. And within Aquina, there are sites where people had winter homes and sites where they had summer homes and cornfields. And they didn't have to be, you know, 100 miles apart or west of the Rockies or anything. It could be just a little bit more inland, you know. Um, but when other people come in and buy the land, that disrupts what we had always done. Let's see. So we went from being an original village in Aquina. Mashby also is one of the 69 original villages. Um, on the island, there were four. In addition to Aquina, there was Nunapog, which is roughly in the Edgartown area, Chappaquiddick, which is Chappaquiddick Island, and Takami, which is up in the West Tisbury area. Um, now there's just the one at Aquina. And Aquina went from being an original village to what we call the district, an Indian district, which is another way of saying a reservation. And, you know, the people from the other villages were, um, attempted to be moved on to the reservation, if you will. Because Aquina, um, if you don't know, is at least in, you know, in those a long time ago was a very hard place to get to. It's way at the end of the island. Um, and that's what reservations do. They put the Indians out of the way of other folks. Um, and with the, with the Indian districts, you know, people were allotted certain acre, amounts of acreage, okay, to, to farm or, you know, there were areas that were woodlots, um, whatever. And breaking up the land into these sections like that, you know, also was an interruption. It flipped, you know, our traditional ways of relating to the land, along with like the men farming and the women not and all that sort of thing. And then going from an Indian district to a town, both Mashby and Aquina have a similar history, you know, with that pattern. And then both in 1870 were uh, incorporated as towns in the state of Massachusetts. And in both cases, against the will of the Wampanoag people there, because we could see, you know, what, what would be happening. 
Um, so all of these things, you know, have um, our land, we've, we've not tended to it as we would have. You know, sometimes it's even illegal. You're on somebody's private property, you know, this sort of thing. So we did not take care of the land like our ancestors did. And now, you know, with every other people coming in, and I find it almost ironic that people call de what people call development, which sounds like you're building something positive, like houses, businesses, you know, whatever, uh, condos, you know, what have you. But all of those things have completely altered the way that we use the land and have contributed to um, you, you know, the destruction of the land and the environment. It disrupts, if I can use solar, um, I was thinking of a, a place, a number of acres here in Mashpee where a certain individual wanted to put up a solar farm and it got voted down in the town or whatever. And he went and cut down all the trees. It was a forested area. He went and cut down all those trees anyway. And then there are adjacent neighborhoods that all of a sudden there's more rabbits and squirrels and coyotes and rats and foxes and raccoons and birds, hawks, whatever, displaced all of these animals. Trees that were, I don't know, 50, 100 years old. Those are our relatives. There's a lot of white pine in there. And if that man was thinking like those were relatives, personally, I don't think he would have been thinking about solar farms in the first place. Because solar farms cannot do what trees can do. Um, but it's, you know, and it's thinking like that. That's one example. And there's many, I could go on for, you know, ever. <laughs> um, you know, thinking like that, that has brought us to this brink of environmental collapse that we're experiencing today, okay? And taking care of the earth is a responsibility of all humans. You know, that's for all of us to do. Um, and together, you know, is better. Um, and I think, it, you know, we can certainly learn from the values and the practices of our ancestors, um, all ancestors. You know, there are many tribes that are facing grappling with immediate impacts of uh, climate change and whatnot. Um, but our goal is to restore the balance of nature. That's the only thing that will work. And anything that's done, solar, wind power, whatever, fossil fuel, whatever it is, has to be measured up against that. And if it, you know, if it is gonna, if it's gonna disrupt it or destroy it in any way, then it's not gonna work. You know, I think, and, and that's where I've come to in my thinking about it, and which is pretty a harsh place to be. But I think that um, we need to have new thoughts about all of this. So um, thank you. Glad to answer any questions when we get there. Thank you, Linda, for your thoughts and your perspective on this. Um, I think we can turn it over to Brett to talk about how he takes sort of the information that Linda just shared and how he puts this into, per, you know, into practice with his work. Um, but of course, Linda, always interject when Brett is talking if he doesn't do it correctly. Yeah, it, it happens a lot. <laughs> um, you know, over the, I've, I've been fortunate enough to serve the tribe for 29 years. And I'll, and I'll start off by uh, just saying to everyone that I am not a citizen of the Wampanoag Nation. I know everyone always questions that in the very beginning, and it's true. Uh, I am not a tribal citizen, but I, I've worked with the tribe for, uh, going on 30 years, I've uh, been lucky to do so. And I've listened to Linda uh, for most of those years and it's always, you know, it, it's a 
great experience for me to, to just sit and listen to her and, and the perspective. And so I'm glad to be here today and to share with you. And I, and I think that my goal here is just to give a crash course in what is a natural resources department for this tribe. Uh, and it, you know, it, there's a lot of similarities between uh, the Wampanoag tribe of Gayetaquina and other tribes. Uh, there are some things that we do better and, and some things that we're a little lagging behind in Indian country. Um, so uh, again, I, part of what my duties are is to oversee the natural resources department. Uh, I also oversee facilities and maintenance, a few other things, but so the natural resources department for the Wampanoag tribe, what does that look like? Um, we have a ranger program. So we have um, up to two, right now I have one uh, ranger. That's a law enforcement emergency medical responder uh, to tribal lands. Um, I have a environmental program coordinator. Uh, so that's someone who helps me with grant writing, uh, keeping up with uh, all the local, state, and federal protocol that uh, falls up upon our programs. And then uh, the, we have a laboratory, a state certified laboratory uh, that um, over the years we've developed. And I have two people that work there, a lab manager and assistant manager. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we do with that. And then um, I have uh, some, a, a few other people that help out with specific things like fishery specialists and uh, biologist type person that helps out. So the team is very small. We're not, a, we're not a big program. We're not a big department, but um, you know, our focus and our goal um, is to protect, preserve, and enhance the natural resources of the Wampanoag tribe for the benefit of tribal citizens for seven generations. So how is my job different than maybe a municipal natural resource manager is we're not really looking at what we do on a day-to-day. -day. We're really looking at it on a long-term. How, how are things going to impact the future use of the resource and how is it going to impact the ability for future generations to utilize the same resources that have been here historically? So that's where the climate issues really come into play. I, I think I have a couple of examples that may help uh, sort of describe what we're working on and what we do. Um, to give a little bit of background, the tribe owns, maintains uh, a, approximately 600 acres of land in the town of Aquina, which is on the western end of Martha's Vineyard. The land is held in trust um, by the Department of Interior for the benefit of the tribe. So. It's interesting because it's tribal land, but there are there are some strings that come with that. Uh, to, to have the sole discretion to do what they want on the property, there actually are rules and regulations that impact Department of Interior. Um, things like leasing, subleasing, roadways, it's, uh, it's very specific on on how that works. So um, they do have fee property that just like other people have property, um, they own property that way um, that they actually pay taxes on. And um, on uh, on the tribal property, we have a uh, little over thirty houses, and we have about a hundred, a little over a hundred citizens that live on this land, which is remarkable. Housing is a, a terrible issue that the tribe is dealing with out here uh, on Martha's Vineyard and in Akona specifically, where the cost of land is so high, the ability for people to come to their homeland is nearly impossible. So uh, the tribe is, is battling uh, the same issues as other uh, places are, like how do you develop? How do you do it consciously? How do you do it in a way that brings community how do you lay the infrastructure so that you're best utilizing the land and bringing people home? Bringing people home is a, is a big priority around here. It's something that we talk about just about daily in my job. Um, so there is a housing authority, uh, which is a uh, subset of the tribe. So the tribal council has authorized the lease of land to the housing authority, and the housing authority has a director and deals with the day-to-day -day operations of housing. So 
that's not part of my direct oversight every day, but we certainly work together on everything it takes to bring people home. So in our programs, like I said, we have we have natural resources. So we deal with just about anything, whatever town you live in, um, we deal with all the same stuff, right? Like, so we have roads, we have, um, you know, a tree falls down, uh, you know, anything that could happen during a day where like a town hall or a, someone might call for assistance, we, we deal with, we deal with all the same things. Um, most of our focus, of course, is, is natural resource based, but we get thrown wiffle balls just about every day in this job in just about every different uh, thing that you could even imagine. Our focus in our natural resource programs, of course, are land, water, and air. Uh, we have uh, programs in, in each of those areas uh, to, and they're highly technical. Uh, so we have um, we have programs like with federal agencies, and our programs have to prove competency in those in those programs. So when we deal with road runoff here, um, just like the town would. Uh, you have a road and there's road running and there's road runoff and it's causing a, an issue maybe to a stream. Um, we've proven competency in those programs to the federal level with the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Um, so we manage that, those things, but we have very complicated plans uh, that go over what our list of options are uh, to remedy issues. So, there's this there's this discussion all the time about TEK, but you know, so traditional ecological knowledge and how does that impact tribes? And, and I think that our program is, is interesting to people who have no insight to tribal programs, because why would you? Why would anyone know what a tribal natural resource department does? It's not something that you encounter or run into every day. Um, so my role here is unique. Obviously, I am not the one bringing cultural knowledge or background. Uh, obviously, I am not the person who brings forth um, the historical cultural knowledge. But it's my job to create competency in programs and bring the science so that the culture can be expressed. So the only way that tribes have to battle right now, the only ring that there is to fight in is, is historic rights, which are something that are taken very seriously and, and, um, and, and scientific proof. So you can talk about what's right every day, and you can say, hey, you know, we shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't be doing that. But we've built a laboratory, we've built research projects that have to show competency and show um, exactly what it is that might be impacting resources. So in our laboratory, uh, right in the corner, like we're state certified for uh, microbiology. So and we're a contract laboratory. So if you want to sell your house and you need to have a water test, you bring it to us. Um, if during the summer people want to go to the beach and uh, they want to go swimming in the water, the state says, hey, you know, there's certain swimmable standards that we have to meet. We have that contract. We evaluate that water. Um, we also have particulate monitoring on our property. So um, air particulates that come down and land on, on a corner soil are evaluated, sent to a laboratory in California, and then expressed nationally with the United States Environmental Protection Agency uh, for air quality data. So when there's fires in Canada, and we're picking up atmospheric deposition from that, and, and we show that right here in our own programs. We have an ozone program here uh, also that proves the connectedness to ozone 
in the New England region that ozone can actually come over water and to a different area. Um, so we have ozone monitoring in our laboratory. We have um, we have a, a piece of equipment that can test fish tissue for mercury. And you say, why is that? Why? Well, mercury deposition starts anywhere in the world and it can end up here. And in, ingestion of fish is obviously something that we're concerned about because our, our, the, the, the native people here eat higher levels of fish than most people do anywhere in the United States. So the cumulative factor of ingestion it directly impacts the health of tribal citizens. So our program has moved in these directions in response to what the needs of the community are. So our program is different than uh, you know, other tribes where we're perhaps more scientific um, in certain areas, but um, again, we're also growing shellfish. Uh, you know, we grow base scallops every year and we take those juvenile base scallops, we put them out into, um, into the pond and we put them in these protected areas that we've taken out in basic crabs, um, green crabs, uh, spider crabs. So we trap the crabs in these areas, we get rid of the crabs, we put scallops in and um, we let those grow. And then every other year, um, so they come to maturity after a year and a half. So we swap those areas. And so there's aquatic farming that we're involved with. Um, I think I have a, a couple of examples that might um, help people understand how or why it's important to uh, maybe partner with tribes, because I think that's something that that doesn't it's interesting, even municipalities don't think about it that much, but I'll just give a, a couple of quick examples. Actually, I'll back up for one second, just so you understand how our process works, because again, it's normal to me, not normal to everybody else. So um, I work here, I have a, there's a chief of staff who kind of runs the administrative function here. Um, I deal with my team, I have a chief of staff, and then when I have ideas uh, about what direction we should be going in, I rely on a land use committee. So there's a group of tribal members that volunteer to be on a committee. And that's where I pitch ideas. We talk about, that's where I get grounded, where they might say, hey, that's really interesting, Brett, but really what I need you to do is make sure that the cranberry bogs are healthy and I, we want to focus on that. We don't want to focus on, you know, other things. So that's where me as a, as a staff member, I get grounded, right? So I go to my land use committee. And then when there's projects that deal with permitting on tribal property, like we want to build a house, if we want to expand something or we need to do something in the building, we have a commission. So that commission is part of the regulatory body here. They have the ability, just like a conservation commission or, or other places in a, that a municipality may have, serves the same function. And then ultimately, tribal council uh, has the final say uh, of what goes on on these properties. So it's part of my regular, it's part of my regular business to go to a tribal council meeting, give them updates and express what's going on programmatically with, with everything that I'm involved with. So that's how we work internally. Not that much different, I think, than other places. It's just we're smaller, and so that's how it works. So Tribal Council ultimately has the, the final say on what happens here, and they're very in touch with um, things that are moving forward. So like my program, for instance, we rely heavily on grants. Um, the tribe and most tribes that I'm familiar with um, don't have a There's no regular income flow, um, like taxation, for instance, like a municipality would. So um, we're very engaged and involved in grant writing and partnering, uh, partnering with federal agencies to, um, to get information or resources. So I, we do a lot of grant writing here. Um, we do a lot of grant management here, which is a whole different skill than 
uh, natural resource work. It's a, it, it takes a lot to keep up with both. Um, so some of our focus areas really are maintaining and protecting sustenance resources. We do a lot of that here. We do a lot of talk about sustenance resources and, and what we have to do to protect them. So in terms of partnering, uh, one good example was Hurricane Sandy. So Hurricane Sandy came through here and this is a piece of property called Lopsyville Road, absolutely gorgeous landscape. Uh, it's a, a dune beach area. It's well known to people worldwide for fishing. Um, so it came through and all of a sudden our road uh, was cut in half and there was about a seven foot drop from the road straight down. Uh, it was happened overnight. It was horrific. So, and that was, that is access to um, one of the largest pieces of tribal property, uh, which is where our dunes are, uh, where our cranberries are and the beach plums. It's a wild harvest area is known as the common lands where people would go and, and harvest. In fact, the tribe was at cranberry day uh, right after indigenous people's day and uh, happens every year, but that's a day where the kids have the day off from school, the community comes together and harvests uh, cranberries from the cranberry bar. So that had a huge impact. So again, what are we to do? So part of that property was town property and part of it was our property. Tribal lands start 50 feet above the high tide line. So it wasn't all our problem, uh, but um, of course, we're a federal agency. We reached out to FEMA, tried to get some support from FEMA, worked with the municipality, and kind of laid out a plan. How are we going to get this done? There were a lot of hiccups along the way. Nothing ever went smoothly. That's, I think, one of the first things you learn in natural resource management. Uh, almost never goes as planned. We were stuck. Then I got a phone call from the Army Corps of Engineers. Army Corps of Engineers said, hey, um, there's some earmark money. We're going to be able to dredge this area called the Manipsha Channel. And because some extra money came in during Hurricane Sandy. So it wasn't their intent to put the sand back where it was lost. It was the intent to go to the shortest distance. And so again, this is where I think that the, the tribal perspective is a little bit different, right? So you have a federal agency that comes in and says, well, we're going to dredge, but it's going to go to the closest place, the shortest distance, the least amount of money. And then you have a municipality that says, well, we're only control of this property, so we can't say what happens on that property. And the tribe, who is also, who is a partner in all this, I'm lucky where I get to take a step back and say, let's, I'm going to look at the big picture I need to look at the resource. I'm not looking at the lines as much as I am the resource. And because I work for the tribe, I can dip my feet in and try and partner. And so long as the tribe agrees with that partnership, we can try and move forward. So the short of that story is it took a lot of years. We're seven years on that location. But the ultimately the town of Chilmark refused the sand that was going to go on its property. The town of Okona accepted the sand that was going to go on its property. And then the town of Okona ultimately said, well, we don't feel comfortable telling the tribe where the sand should go. We need to work with them. And so if you can envision the end of a pipe where all this sand is going to come out, eventually it moved itself a mile and a half up at extra expense to go where it was needed. And so if you flash forward four years from the time that we finished that project, we now have more clovers in that area than we've ever had before. The area is restored. We grow beach grass out there each year, and we've now restored a, you know, a two-mile stretch of land. Um, so here's the hard part for the tribe. There was no extra money that came into the department to deal with that for seven years. 
that was something that we went after congressional money. We went after money from the United States Environmental Protection Agency. We went after money from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we, we tied together all sorts of different programs to get to that point. So partnering with a tribe, sometimes there's an ability to look beyond something that's linear and look towards the what might be considered the common good of a resource. And, and I have a lot of examples like that. I'm lucky. I have a lot of examples like that over the years. Um, but I, I would say that that's the biggest part of what I do is stand up for the rights of the tribe and put a definitive line there in the sand about what their rights are and then protect resources that encourage the protection of those uh, resources for future generations. I know we're getting close on time, so I, I just wanted to do a quick check in. Um, no, we're good. Uh, if you want to give one or two more examples, I think we have the time for that before we do questions, or we can dive right into some of the questions. Love it. I've, I've got a great project right now that's very uh, it's interesting to me. I'm passionate about it. And it, it kind of gives an example of how saddening the whole picture is. Um, herring are a um, critical resource uh, for the tribe. Historically, culturally, um, it's one of those fish that's always been there. And in the blink of an eye, in the blink of my eye from the time that I started here, um, those numbers have declined. So seven years ago, um, again, you know, highlighting what are we going to be working on, um, the real, the, the evident decline of this fish was staggering in the, even just the, the 30 years that I've been here. So we went after some federal money with, you had partnered with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with just a little bit of money. I mean, I am not talking about a lot of money. We make a little money go a long way. I've always said in the years and years and years and years that I've been doing this with all the different people, you get more bang for your buck working with a tribe than anywhere else because you're going to find people that are passionate, that care about the outcome, and are willing to do more than expected to see it happen. But, and that is the absolute truth in Indian country. You can go anywhere you want. I guarantee it's true. So we started to, so we put in underwater technology and underwater counting system, um, technical, very technical stuff. Uh, to try to figure out the what's going on with our hair. So when we first put in the camera system, we all sort of took bets, right? Like, how many hair do you think there'll be? I was like, well, I mean, there has to be, I don't know, 150, 200,000. Like, yeah, there has to be. I mean, there probably has to be more than that. So like, I, I didn't even know how we were going to count them. Because it was all anecdotal. You'd go down there one night, and I've been there when it was just... There were so many, there wasn't enough oxygen to keep them all alive. They flooded the banks and um, they were taken, uh, you know, just 20 years ago, they were taken and they were used for lobster bait. They're used culturally. I'm sure Linda could explain, you know, as part of growing in the, in the spring, eating herring roe is, is a, absolutely a part of everybody in this community as they were growing up. Uh, brine herring, salting herring uh, to, you know, as a food source. Well, the first year that we did it, there was, we counted 39,000. And I, and I swore to Andrew, who's my lab manager, I was like, well, we got to fix whatever's wrong with that because we missed about 150,000 fish. So something's wrong. The next year, 37,000 fish. We were spot on. We can count every fish that comes back to tribal land. And that is horrible. But it's funny because when I talk about our herring counting, people always say, oh, that's so interesting. Yep, it is, but it's horrible. The fact that you can count the number of fish that are coming back. So, that's led us into how are we going to restore this fishery? And so much of it, it, it we can't. So we, the tribe, we went ahead, again, 
went to the books, grant writing, resources, finding partnerships, we dredged the our channel so that we could get better flushing into and better access into the fishery so that we could get the Herring Creek open deeper so that there was less predation. Uh, so we did that, that was phase one. Phase two is really understand the impacts and keep track of the numbers. Well, the numbers have been slow and steady right around that number. Now we, we have, I have a partnership with, a, a different partnership with Army Corps of Engineers that, on their technology side. Um, so now we're looking at bottom substrate habitat and impacts. And uh, even, even just earlier today, I, I mean, I literally just got out of waders uh, 35 minutes before I got onto this because I have a team of people um, down in our Herring Creek right now where we're putting acoustic tags in striped bass. So we also tag herring too, but um, these acoustic tags are just like the sharks where there'll be monitors in the pond and we'll be able to pick up their location and see, um, watch or track the activity of striped bass because A, we know that they're big predatory fish to the herring, but B, again, tying into the climate, uh, and we're seeing them year round where we don't, I don't really remember that happening year round before. Warmer waters, less ice, habitat change. Um, so now we're wondering like, boy, are these fish really, are, are they eating the fry all summer long? And is that, is that why we, we have less? We know offshore fishery has the most tremendous impact on this. We're trying to figure out what we can do. What's our part? What's our role? And taking this information that we gather and giving it to the, the federal agencies and the resource groups that deal with offshore fishery. So we're, we have an active role and an active voice in both areas. Um, so again, that the connection between culture and technology in my world is every day. And like, again, an, another interesting part of, uh, of those impacts are in, in terms of change, um, it, which is close to Linda's heart and the tribe too, is, uh, is we have a research project right now that we're trying to find, which is related to wampum. And I think most people probably know what wampum is, that purple color in a quahog shell. Interestingly enough, nobody knows exactly why it turns purple. Um, which that always, that's very interesting to me. The science side of that is very interesting to me. But as we have, um, as we have change in temperature and food, the concern is, are we still gonna have wampum if we have food change and temperature change? So um, again, another research project that we have brewing now to connect culture, change and technology and, and get to those answers and protect the resources because what could be more important to protect than the than really the history of not only our first currency in the US, but I mean the, the thing that has tied the Wampanoag tribe together um, since time began. Thank you for that, Brett. Um, Linda. I, I would just like to add something in terms of herring and what Brett was saying about herring, because um, you know I was mentioning earlier the the uh, Europeans who came here in the 16th and 17th centuries and and they used to write down that when the herring was on their spawning run in the spring, um, the the rivers were just black with them. There were so many fish that you could walk across the backs of the fish to get across the river, you know and um, and then the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe today has a, a rights of herring initiative that they're working on. And that was actually one of the questions that someone had was if you could talk more about the rights of herring. Well, what I wanted to say was that um, they have discovered in the herring, and I I'm, I'm, can't remember if it's the herring roe or the, the liver of the fish, but when they open the fish up, uh, I think it's the roe, it's gray. Typically they're orange, golden color, you know, if they're healthy. 
and but these are gray and and it's like so it's you know as brett said there's the over harvesting thing um i mean 20 30 years ago we used to purchase herring at the Wampanoag program at the plantation uh, to fertilize our garden, which was a small garden, maybe a 10th of what would one family would have had, you know, which was 400 mounds, 800 fish. And we're purchasing frozen herring that were gotten for, you know, the lobster bait or whatever else they might use them for, rather than go out and get more fish, you know, ourselves. And they're like six inches long. They're young fish, they're tiny. You know, and uh, and now it's like, you know, the, so there's the over harvesting thing, but that what is it in the environment, in, in the ponds, in the rivers, in the ocean that are causing these fish to be so sick that they're, that they have gray uh, row, you know, so. Um, I can yeah. touch on, um, in terms of uh, the rights to herring, uh, I don't want to limit the conversation to herring, but the, the state of Massachusetts has, has clearly recognized uh, sustenance rights of uh, Wampanoag people. I, I, and I'm only going to speak for the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead Aquina. Um, I, don't, I don't want to speak for Mashby, but, I'll, but I, I'll just speak for what I know to be for the tribe, of, for Aquina, is, the, is um, that a uh, a Wampanoag citizen engaged in sustenance harvesting has the right to do so uh, in, in anywhere that they're legally they're in. So, um, it, so, and it doesn't matter what season, and it for the most part doesn't matter by what utility they are harvesting. So, um, if someone is bow hunting on the Fourth of July and throws a deer over their shoulder and joins the parade, then you, there's no phone calls to be made. There's nothing necessary there. Um, and if an environmental police officer in, encounters that tribal citizen, it, it should be short and sweet. Uh, you know, there's, they have, the tribe has issued tribal identification cards and a, and a tribal member uh, has the right to do so. So, um, I, I get a lot of calls about, you know, activities that are taking place. And I've met, you know, plenty of police departments at odd hours and in interesting places. And uh, that's that's the way it works. And, and size, size and limit also. Like I'll, I'll, I'll just save your phone calls on size and limits. Uh, don't call, don't bother. Um, if someone, if there's a fish that you believe to be over or under uh, anything, uh, what you're referencing is a Massachusetts law, not a sustenance right. So that's, it doesn't apply. Thank you, because uh, we had a question come into the Q&A about if you could share more about how hunting restrictions differ for uh, Wampanoag for tribal members. So Brett is correct. The, those rights supersede Massachusetts law on that. Um, sort of related back to the fish, um, sorry to go back to that, but we had a question about um, related to like the rights of herrings or alewives and things like that. Just do either of you have thoughts about uh, many of the conversations in our state and our communities around dam removal and um, what communities should be thinking about in terms of um, fish and the health of the ecosystem when they're discussing um, river dam removals. There's a great example in the Penobscot Indian uh, Nation of dam removal where they actually purchased a dam that was then deconstructed and worked with the utility to build, uh, they, where the, the utility built a dam in a different location with a fish ladder and now they've brought alewives up to the far further north regions than they've seen in 150 years. And they also have salmon uh, going back to traditional uh, historic areas. Um, so again, you know, our, we don't have dam issues out here on Martha's Vineyard, except for in the streams uh, where there is some limited access uh, through some like properties for herring. 
But I think that, again, in, it, it's a partnering thing because there's, there's new technologies and probably better places where things could be put that would allow for natural processes to, to take place. But that, I mean, the, the Penobscot Indian story is a great one. Uh, John Banks was a natural resource director up there for a long time, really wonderful guy. And I, and I, I think that he hung with that uh, to see that through. And it's a great story. It's available on there. They, they made a great video about it. But again, another example of where tribes can be involved in bigger picture. Like let's let's look at the big picture and let's look at the picture from the perspective of the resource. How can we be better? Um, and, and Brett, to, to add to that, and I, I, I guess I kind of have a question myself. Um, there's a, over in Kingston, Mass, near Plymouth, um, we were visiting uh, some folks over there and in back of their property is a pond and it, there's a little herring river that runs down and there's a, someone had put in a dam like a hundred years ago. And that's what caused this pond to form. So, cause the water just filled in that area because of the dam and whatnot. But now a hundred years later, that's formed its own ecosystem. And they're talking about taking out the dam so things can return to their natural state. But, you know, isn't, you know, it has to be done in a way like what you were describing with the Penobscot, done in a way that considers the impact of the removal of that dam so that you don't disturb the new ecosystem that's developed. Because, you know, there's all kinds of birds and fish and animals and whomever to plants that are depending on that pond right now. You know, so that's sort of a half question, half statement thing I had going on there. <laughs> Um, another question that we had, let me just pull it up, is how can municipal governments collaborate respectfully and intentionally on climate issues with local tribes? And I think specifically, I would be interested in knowing about, you know, municipalities, cities, towns that aren't located on Martha's Vineyard or, you know, maybe even on the Cape, but this is traditional Wampanoag homeland. So how can they support efforts or work with um, perhaps the natural resource department? It, it's so easy. I, I, I don't even I don't even understand why that would be difficult. The, 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 first of all, like the, the tribes have to have everything that a, that a, a state would have to have, like a pre-disaster mitigation plan, a, you know, the tribes have to have all the same kind of documentation that states do for it, when they run programs in that area, right? So it's, it's, in most cases, the capability really is there. People who deal with roads and infrastructure and all those things. And when a municipality is submitting or creating a document, it has so much more weight when it has the interests of the tribe involved. It, I do this every day, I've done it for 30 years. And I, it, to me, it's obvious. I mean, I, I don't know a lot about much other things. So I mean, believe me, my, my, it's an error, what I know. But the, when you talk about planning, to so here's how here's how we were involved in in the in the state. So the state had the state of Massachusetts had guidance for the Department of Environmental Protection for roadway management and all that. So our input was, hey, you know, you can't just use regular road salt around wetlands and cranberry bogs. We need to have. Uh, improve technology for stormwater collection around protected sites. We really need to, um, you know, if we're gonna think about roadway expansion, it sh here's a map of cultural areas that we should be avoiding and planning other routes. Like to not include the tribe is silly on so many different reasons because and when you do that, the weight of it is so much heavier. 
it, because when it gets further along in the process, when it gets to the federal dollars, and you actually have a substantial partnership there, the ability to get funding or things move forward. Because um, remember, a, a lot of these things that are that are municipal or federal have to have like historic preservation review, section 106 compliance for um, cultural artifacts. It, it, it can save you so much time, but forget the time. That's, again, it, it's, it's really the right thing to do, but I, I, think that, I think that the whole process is gonna come out so much better. Uh, on the island, we like we do. There's an island-wide emergency planning, and there's island-wide, you know, um, you know, documents for uh, you know what we're going to do long-term, short-term for uh, climate adaptation. We've been part of that. the The tribe actually put forth a representative to serve on the committee on the natural resources, um, so that they would be good insight from the tribe and tribal and sign off from the tribal council as they moved it forward but what a difference to it, let's say that let's say that the municipal agency was going after funding to redo a, a bridge and they already understand that hey look if the tribe is going to be part of this bridge the the water is the, we're not sending the road runoff right into the river like we've done in the past right we're going to fix that um and, and there's this whole invisible infrastructure that a, a lot of people don't understand, like the like the Wampanoag tribe here, we have what's called a, a, an IRR system, it's Indian Reservation Road System, right? So we have roads here, but we also need, the tribe also have to act, has to access the ferry system, which is in two different towns. And that means that people have to go over bridges so in the town of Tisbury, which is on the other end of the island, when they, they had to replace a drawbridge that went up and down, we only have one that goes up and down. Well, when they went to do that, there was a million dollars set aside for tribes that was held on, on the federal side that was then released to the state to support that project because the tribal the tribal citizens had to use that bridge in order to get to the to the to one of the ferries so uh, it's not just about the money this is about community but it makes so much more sense to have those conversations ahead of time it really does um in in uh, mashpee the mashpee wampanoag tribe education department um within which is the Rights of Herring uh, initiative, but they also have uh, another um, initiative that's going before the town um, you know, meeting, but there's a, a place in town called 12 Acres, that it's a hill that's above uh, Mashpee Pond. And <clears throat> they, uh, years ago, uh, 50, almost 50 years ago, the, the, the town, uh, was working with tribal members to create, you know, a traditional Wampanoag village. And now the tribe has gotten, you know, a grant to build a, a traditional village and to also recreate all the processes that go into making a village, which is harvesting cedar for house frames, harvesting reeds to make the mats that cover the houses and, you know, and all this sort of thing, right? And so now uh, we're going through the process of going before the town uh, to, you know, to get it approved and, and all of that sort of thing. And the, the land that's included in this 12 acre parcel, you know, it includes the beachfront that goes right up to Mashpee Pond. Uh, and right now, all of that is town land. So the tribe is asking the town Number one, they're asking the town to turn over this 12 acres to the tribe so they can build this village, which would be a living history museum sort of thing. But I find that ironic since it was initially Mashpee Wampanoag tribal land anyway, that was through nefarious means gotten away. 
from people. Um, but that being said, um, the young lady who's in charge of this project, you know, was presenting to, uh, I think the select board and um, was getting some pushback and, and like, and it was, we've had several meetings. I, I can't remember which one some of these comments come from, but it's like, there, there's a general thinking that if the tribe gets this land turned over to them, that the tribe is there and taking away something from the rest of the Mashpee community at large. Okay, that is a fear that has roots back in history that needs to be addressed. Um, one lady was asking, well, can't you leave the beach part of it with the town? Because she was afraid that if the, the tribe owns the beach that no one else is gonna be able to go down to the beach. This is a public beach. You can't go swimming there anymore because the you know there's so many houses around the perimeter of the pond that just issue you know nitrogen from the sewers and everything right out into the pond water. Um, so there is that, and you know it's like jumping through hoops to explain to people that number one the tribe didn't create these boundaries. You know they did that in conjunction with you know administration of the town. Um, but having this beachfront also be part of the 12 acres, just as Brett was saying, the tribe has access to federal dollars, you know, for water cleanup, which they couldn't utilize if that beachfront property wasn't part of the uh, 12 acre package, you know, and so, you know, just this whole idea that the tribe is taking something and it, it almost blocks reasonable thinking and um, brett was just describing the same thing that the tribe has has access to different monies than towns do and 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 this would if utilized it can benefit everybody we're not trying to hurt anybody you know and, and so it's you know it's sort of a that's another aspect that i think people need to understand because they don't i'm so glad why brett explained everything about how natural resource and whole tribal structure is because people don't know that there's tribes in people's backyards and they need to understand you know uh, you know what what that means you know to be a federally recognized tribe and and how it can benefit everybody and i and i don't want to make it uh, appear as though everything works easily because just like every other place in the world, uh, it, it, it's hard. These are hard issues. These are hard issues for the tribe. These are hard issues for the, for the citizens of the tribe. And, and so if, if, you, if someone brings an idea or a concept and it's not just joyously received, I, I guess my, for 30 years in this, I would say don't be disheartened because it, these aren't easy, None of these are easy conversations, I think, for anybody, especially when, it, when we talk about community and community protection and what's best for a community. Um, but I think the longer that you talk, the more, the more things boil down, in my experience, is we can find common denominators and we can work on those and then build on successes. And I, I mean, I have endless stories of where we could disagree on a lot, but we agree on something and we were able to make headway in an area that we both agreed on and it was better for everyone. And I, I mean, I could talk all day about not seeing eye to eye, but absolutely loving each other and, and working on projects together. So it, it, there's always a lot at stake for everyone who's involved in these conversations. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of uh, emotions that people bring to environmental issues on the Cape, on the islands, no matter where you are. Community is, I, I mean, I think Linda said it best, right? I mean, you know, it, it, it's not just a name, it's where you're from. And, and, and that has the weight of family written right into it. So um, I, I think as we, as we find little things that we can do together, I, I, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of benefit in that. Lots of stories about that. Well, thank you, both Brett and Linda. I think as we wrap up our virtual program today, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions that we had, 
but um, I'd like to, of course, convey our thanks to our speakers for enriching our understanding of these crucial topics, and I think providing us with some insights that will guide many of us in our ongoing work. So I'm really appreciative of your time and your expertise and sharing your experience with us. Um, I do wanna move on to some important announcements. So firstly, we encourage everyone who tuned in today to stay engaged with our upcoming sessions. So save the date on your calendar for uh, Thursday, October 26 at 12 p.m. when we will be back with our session number four. And this one will feature Kristen Wyman, who is a member of the Nipmunk Nation, and she is focusing on how to engage in more collaborative and rights-based rights-based approach to climate resilience with a specific focus on local indigenous foodways can support a more robust and resilient ecosystem in the context of our rapidly changing climate. Um, and then we will be followed by the final session on Friday, November 3rd at 12 p.m. And we are committed to providing you with valuable content. So we hope to see you at those two sessions. And additionally, we invite everyone to visit our landing page regularly. This is where we'll be uploading the presentations. And again, we'll be sending out um, a follow-up email to all our registrants with um, links to some of the things that were mentioned today. Um, and lastly, a sincere thank you to everyone to, in our audience for being part of this valuable virtual program. And we truly appreciate your support. So have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much.